as Marina said, I'm on the TF. I'm a PhD student at NYU. I research software supply chain security here in the CNCF. I'm one of the maintainers of Intoto, and for about a year, just over a year now, we've been building GitHub uh, for securing Git repositories. So, you know, uh, just to get, just to, you know, lay out the land a bit. The state of Git security today is uh, Git is content addressed, so you get some integrity checks out of the box. It also has some semantics for things like signing your commits and tags and pushes too, but setting that aside for now. Uh, it, if, if you looked at a best practice guide for source control, uh, source code management systems in, in the last few years, you probably come across this thing that says you should sign your commits and things like that. And you know, Git does that, offer, allows you to do that out of the box. But uh, what Git does not support is uh, actually defining policies around all of these things. It's, it's like uh, if I'm supposed to be signing my commits and so on, what like as a verifier, as, as someone who's actually going to verify those signatures, how do they know what keys to trust for that repository? And uh, when should they stop trusting a key for that repository? Maybe the key was lost, or maybe the developer stopped working on the project and they're no longer considered a maintainer. You know, that keeps happening. Uh, other access control-ish things like, uh, oh, uh, what kind of actions can a developer take in a repository? Like, are they allowed to merge something into the main branch? Typically not, that's typically a, uh, capability you limit to a handful of maintainers and so on, or uh, what kind of which which of which files a developer can write to or conversely not write to, things like that, uh, which is just not supported in Git repositories. So that's that's these are the kind of questions we started out with, and that's where uh, I'm going to present to you, you know, GitHub. So one of the first things we started doing in GitHub is to try and see how we could store policies around all of the, these kinds of, you know, to, to try and answer and to try and uh, enforce those kinds of checks in a Git repository within the repository itself. Uh, we, uh, Git allows you to store things in custom namespaces, which is really, really neat, and we take advantage of that quite a bit. Uh, so we encode policies using some semantics from the update framework, a graduated project here at the CNCF, which you might have heard of a bit in the last few days especially as well as some uh, semantics from the Intoto project, uh, which the asterisk up there shows is a work in progress because uh, I opened that PR last week and it's not been merged yet. Uh, but anyway, so the idea is to use these semantics to declare trusted signing keys for the repository and specify namespace specific rules for that repository, right? So uh, this is just, something I put up there to show that all of this is like very Git native. So if you start looking at, uh, if you start impl implementing Git stuff in a Git repository and you start poking around the custom namespace, it just looks like another commit history thing. And, and if you actually like uh, in start inspecting this commit, you're just gonna see those uh, uh, policies I was just talking about. And you know, it, this, this was from our demo and it's just something I added to uh, the policy. Like I added a rule to protect the main branch. Right, and that's pretty much what the rule looks like. It, it, it's like for the main branch, the only person who's trusted to merge something in there is my own identity. And here I'm using uh, git sign to identify me uh, from the six store project. So it just says that uh, like any change I make to the main branch must be authorized by my signature issued using that you know identity, my email ID coming from GitHub. Uh, and you can verify that entire flow with six store. That's that's roughly it. But also more generally speaking, you can define policies for like, oh, this this person can write to this file and this person can write to these branches and so on and so forth. So with with all of that, you get to do things like, oh, I can verify signatures using Git tough policies for commits uh, and tags, which is like very similar to what Git already gives you, but you know, it doesn't actually, you, you have to bring your own keys and so on, but GitHub tries to plug that hole a bit. But you can also verify changes that were made to a ref or, or a branch or a tag and so on. Uh, and, and again, that uses the GitHub policy. And, and interestingly, because all of this is tracked within the repository itself using Git's own semantics, you can revoke keys in the event of, you know, the key getting compromised or developer leaving your team. and and that, that it's a useful property because everything they did up until that point can continue to be trusted 
and everything after that point, you know, you know when to stop trusting their key, which is just something you don't get if you don't closely associate these kinds of policies with a repository. And to be able to verify uh, changes that happen to a ref, it's not you know, enough to just look at the main branch. We also need to know when a change happened to the main branch. And that's where we also uh, introduce something like, well, not introduced, we implement something called a reference state log. It's, it was first described in an academic paper from, I want to say 2016, yeah, 2016. And uh, it is, you can think of it like, uh, like the Git ref log, but it's authenticated and actually shared with like all of the developers of the repository. It's also tracked in the custom namespace. It's basically a constant tracker of changes that happen to different branches and tags and so on. Right, and, and again, uh, th this is also, I said it's authenticated, it uses the same git signing mechanisms, uh, you could use gpg, git sign, whatever. Like here's, here are a couple of examples, it's just, this is an entry, the change is to the main branch and the main branch's tip is now that commit ID and before that the main branch had that other commit ID. So it's just a log of how the branches evolve over time. Uh, I also want to note that I, I like I called out that we want to start supporting in Toto, uh, but but like more broadly speaking, uh, we think there's a lot of room here to st also start using attestations uh, because you can also start answering all kinds of other questions that you know that 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 uh, go back to the data that you'd store in an attestation like oh uh, was was this change that got merged to main reviewed by these two other people what did the code review say. Or uh, before we merge it, did my CI pipeline go and run an automated test and give me a test result attestation? Things like that. And uh, this is also where we really want to plug into Salsa, uh, where there's a lot of ongoing work at the moment on defining a source track uh, centered on all of this because Salsa at the moment, like the spec itself is very focused on the build track, but there's another track coming up called the source track. But, uh, and, and yeah, we, I've got a work in progress um, thing on the GitHub repository that uh, starts implement, has started implementing some lightweight attestations to try and answer some of these questions. And more, yeah, because uh, we, we, you know, like I said, Git, Git gives you that custom namespace, you can track a lot of things in there, and we want to try and make GitHub extensible to support all kinds of other features that may be necessary as, the, you know, as threats evolve and so on. Uh, before I close out and you know open the floor to discussion because this is an unconference, uh, like I want to just highlight a couple of uh, key properties that we've kept in the back of our mind when designing GitDuff because uh, like one of the first things we've been really focused on here is trying to make policy enforcement in Git repositories distributed so every developer can every GitDuff to, every developer who uses GitDuff can verify policy enforcement constantly in their copy of the repository without relying on someone else or a, trust, like a, a single synchronization point to do the policy enforcement for them, which is uh, kind of where we are today. Uh, and, and because all policies are tracked in the Git repository itself and we have the reference state log to track you know, how the policy evolves over time, it also makes it incredibly auditable. Like uh, we now have a log of every change to every policy right down to who made that change to policy and why and things like that. And, and you can also track uh, the active policy for whenever a change was made to some other part of your, like your main branch and you're like, wait a minute, when did this commit enter the main branch and uh, what was the policy active at the time and did it get through all the checks? You, you can make all of these things auditable without you know, it being opaque in a another system, right? This is all, this can now all be stored in your Git repository and uh, verified in a distributed manner. And yeah, the, all of the, and, and because we reuse so many of these Git native semantics like the object store, the custom namespaces and Git signing, uh, any Git repository can use Git tough, right? It doesn't matter whether, uh, I mean, as long as you're not using an incredibly old version of Git, uh, but yeah, any Git repository can start using Git dev and, and uh, you know, the authentication just uses Git signatures, which again, every Git user can, choo can, can start using too. And it doesn't matter, it's compatible with most, all, all forges, you can use it with GitHub, you can use it with GitLab, that's, that's, that's what we're trying to build in here, uh, so that we're agnostic to all of these things. A uh, couple of quick links, we have a GitHub repository uh, where we're building out Git dev. we had our 
first release about two weeks ago. Uh, it's an alpha v0.1.0. It includes some of what I talked about here already, like branch protection, file protection, uh, signature verification stuff. But we're building in things like the attestation support, et cetera, still. And we've got a couple of demos on our GitHub org as well uh, that you can play with. And yeah, uh, happy to, you know, hope, yeah. Questions, feedback, discussion, et cetera. If folks want to say something, please just let me bring the mic over to you so that we, it's available on the recording. So I can run around. Yeah. So what's the um, emphasis and how do you, how would you say, um, how will the wor uh, workflow be when you have a uh, user using Git tough and someone not using Git, uh, not, not using Git tough, right? So I can see an example for, um, where a uh, project is using Git tough, but there's a guy who's like, hey, I don't want to touch that. Like, is there a way you can like assign them a specific key or a system? Like, what's the mechanism for them to like contribute to a repository without using Git tough? And how do you maintain the same guarantees that you were talking about? Maintaining the same, that's a good question. Uh, maintaining the same guarantees in that context is a little hard, but we are working through, like we're thinking through these workflows a lot because yeah, this isn't built into Git itself, so you're gonna have that, especially in open source projects where you've got a subset of people using Git tough and, and like what that looks like. Uh, we're, we're, we're talking about how we can include other authentication methods as well, maybe to see uh, if someone else can like, you know, sign some Git tough specific metadata like, yep, this action is fine because I authenticated it in this separate way and include that information as well so that it's still transparent. But, but again, it's not going to be like exactly the same set of security properties you'd get if everyone was using Git tough. Well done. Um, any plans to upstream this back to Git? Uh, I think not at the moment, but maybe as it matures, I, I would definitely love to explore that some more. But yeah, so we just still like, yeah, we've got to see how this goes. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to add on to that. Like, politically, I think we'd like to do that, but um, historically, that's been a very slow process. So um, we're trying to make some steps forward, and we'd be happy to have that all integrate back in in the future. For context, that's one of the other GitHub maintainers. Any other thoughts, questions? All this is stored in the repo. Uh, what if I push the squash and merge button in GitHub? Also a good question. Uh, that is, again, where we're trying to we're find some workarounds around there. Uh, so we're like hoping that you could maybe, I don't know, build a bot for this. And if GitHub, for example, one day starts supporting, say, using git sign instead of just using their online key to sign that commit that gets created, right? then you press that button and it's still authenticated back to you, right? Like, it, it, these are all things we're still discussing and we're still like, we're building out how we can make GitHub as transparent as possible as opposed to being a bunch of extra commands and a bunch of extra steps that developers have to take because no one's gonna use any security tool that has that kind of burden. But yeah, one of the other maintainers is Billy Lynch who built GitSign over at Sigstore. And uh, like we, we do keep talking about all of this, and we hope that one day this becomes very really seamless as well. And and like uh, yeah. What is the? Um, I'm thinking particularly of like the the branch protections uh, component of this. What is the advantage of using this method for doing that over, say, um, using settings in GitHub to protect certain branches from being merged by, by certain users? Yeah, uh, I think that's where it really goes back to being verifiable, like all the time, and and like being able to walk back the history of all of these merges over time because you can, you know, you're going to have a lot of PRs and you want to know that, that the, the right policy was enforced for each one of them and, and uh, being able to walk back and verify that at, trivially, making it more auditable. Uh, and yeah, I think that's, that's sorry, I thought I had another thing, but it slipped my mind. Maybe it'll come back. 
I, I can maybe add a little bit more to that. So you don't in GitHub have the history of all the policy changes, which is one of the problems because you don't know what's gone wrong. And also you can't apply um, those kind of protections on finer granularities of like files and file per branch and all that other stuff. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at doing also, which is a little bit later down the roadmap is also giving a way to do actually read protections on certain files where they would appear encrypted to people who are not able to access them but would be transparently not you know decrypted by those who are um, so you know you may or may not want to store the worst secrets in the world but sometimes you want to hide things like configuration files or um, e email addresses of employees or stuff like that and so you can go and put those types of things into a repo with some degree of safety. Thanks. Yeah, that the policy change thing was what I was what I forgot right there. Uh, because for example, today you, you you know by default you can turn on branch protection, but you still if you're an admin, for example, you have that merges administrator button that you can also disable that. But if you're an admin, you can also disable that protection that gives you the right to you know go back and then you can turn that back on again and all of this just gets lost in the process so it's hard to tell and hard to audit uh, whereas here you can enforce that more rigorously <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I missed a couple minutes at the beginning so I don't, I don't know if it was mentioned but you're mentioning file specific protections and how does that compare to some uh, get server provider features like github's code owners it, it is similar. Uh, it is quite similar, but again, uh, it, it does tie back into the you know how how does it evolve over time and was it actually enforced at the time and and then like distributing the verification of all of these properties. It is similar, uh, but yeah. I, and again, we want to plug into some of the same things because if, for example, if GitHub starts doing uh, salsa source track attestations around code reviews, which is what you know the code owner's file enforces, it says someone on this file must review for these paths and things like that, like. We want to be able to support that, consuming those attestations in GitHub and verifying it again as well. So, Thanks. so how flexible are you with like different crypto algorithm systems? You mentioned GitSign, but PGP, for example, is also popular to sign your commits, and it has a very different set of attributes and like operations you can do like revocation like how do you stay flexible and still cope with like the different capabilities of those systems right uh, that's a good question uh, we support you know the additional commit signing and whatever you do when you use git duff because the rsl commits etc you do sign them it just uses whatever you want to use as a developer whatever whatever you're configured using on your machine it uses, if you've configured it to use git sign, it's going to use that. If you want to use your GPG key, it does that. But it does, if you, if you, do, uh, if you're doing, it, it, it supports, you know, signing with GPG and it, and, and GitHub policies can distribute and say this GPG key is trusted and so on, but it doesn't plug into like, uh, the actual GPG keys, revocation me mechanisms and so on. It, it, it's already centered around the GitHub policy it, uh, because it, you know, associates all of this information, particularly with this repository. And and so revocation in that context would be within the GitHub policy rather than just, yeah. I guess I can ask a question if anyone else has one. Uh, how do you see this fitting more broadly into a software supply chain security uh, posture? Uh, question uh, well I mean your source code is a pretty big component of your software supply chain right uh, and and where there's a lot of really cool work happening with uh, securing software delivery with projects like tough with securing uh, with a lot of focus right now in like the build parts of your software supply chain with salsa with like in total attestations at the moment that are very more focused on that part of the supply chain rather than the source side of things and and that's how I see it like I think we're just like uh, we, we did the delivery we did the build stuff and now we're moving on to improving the security posture of our source code management systems uh, 
um, I'm really excited to use this with something like Argo CD. I know that uh, it already had like GPG signature verification on Git repos, but I could see this being sort of like a successor to that, which would be really, really cool. Cool. Uh, yeah. Happy to help out if, you know, you and hear about any pain points because there are some sharp edges still. We're in alpha, so. So, um, have you thought about uh, how do you handle a submodule with like transitive trust, where essentially you're sucking in another repo that has like a completely different trust uh, root? And do you think anybody could do anything funny with that to cause like bad stuff to happen in a repo? That's a good question, and uh, there isn't anything in the implementation that you know is centered around that particular model, but uh, I have been, we have been thinking about it a bit. And, and I do want to, uh, like, like, you know, for submodules, I want to be able to map them back to GitHub policy to say, this is what I expect from that submodule, so that even if, like, because if it's not in your control, and if that's a GitHub repository, so you, you, you can do both recursive verification of that GitHub repository and also set expectations on what its trust routes are and so on. But uh, that hasn't been implemented yet, but, you know. Also, yeah, would be happy to sketch that out and so on, some more. Um, in terms of the, the scope of who might be using Git Tough, do you, do you see the application as being more like open source projects where many different entities are kind of working on the same repo? Or do you also see a use case for um, just repos that are totally internally controlled by a company, you know, it's not really shared outside the company. Is there still value for them? I think so. Uh, I don't know if, I, I, I think it's both. Oh, uh, I also see some. Yeah, we're going through tons of stuff like that, uh, like with some of our customers, uh, you know, people who want to make sure that their uh, code has gone through security scanning and you need like something content addressable to attach like an attestation to. Um, so this is a case where like, you know, you have developers building an application, but you still have to go through like a change advisory board process and figuring out how to automate that and, you know, make all these sort of security guarantees. Even things like, you know, has this version of this like repo at this commit been signed off by QA? or whatever kind of bespoke enterprise requirements you might have. More customer, more checking that. Okay. And well, I, th I think to your point, I've, I've been in environments and situations where we needed uh, business logic general controls that we, we started the business logic in, in Git and we didn't, for we had to store our logic or our controls in our CI. Right, to prove that yes, this is this was the policies that were applied and this is what was done. So to be able to store that and get and really to be this is where wherever it wherever our uh, our Git repository is, this is the policy that was applied would be very strong proof that in a like a digital for, forensic conversation, yes, this was applied at this time. Our controls at this place were did not fail and you can go, you know, be faster searching other places. It seems that you're putting quite a lot of trust into Git Sign itself. Are you verifying the actual trust of that? So you're making, you obviously, you're allowing the kind of call out of the, the keys to kind of sign that. Are you, are you verifying that? Uh, or is it just you've got, you know, it's from the key from there? Sorry, I didn't fully so, understand so it's, that. Obviously, it's providing the service of which someone, as I understand it, they can use like their identity to tie it to their key. Um, Surely there's one as if that is actually even compromised that service itself. Right. And yes, you're right uh, on that front. But I, we, we, we use SIGSTOR for, we, what I was trying to say there is that we trust SIGSTOR uh, for that part of it. Uh, and, and like, uh, because, you know, SIGSTOR has a tool that does get signing and, and we do verify all the way back to the transparency log to ensure that that commit signature 
was, yeah, uh, like it, we don't just trust a signature against some random key that was generated by Git sign at that moment in time. We do look for inclusion in recar and, and so on, but yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, and, and I'll also just add that we do support other key types. So it's not, there's no reason why, if you don't want to do that and you have a key, you use your other type of key. Do you have any questions you're asked at about? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, like I said, we're still building a lot of this out. Uh, we're, you know, we're always on the lookout for interesting use cases people have for some of this. If this triggered some ideas in your head or, you know, some thoughts or where you'd like to see it applied, or if you have any concerns around niche Git workflows that you think might break because of some of what I described, I, you know, we'd love to hear them and try to incorporate them in our mental model of how we're designing Git tough, so. That would be really cool. Come, uh, we're we're on the open SS, we're, we're an open SSF sandbox project, so we're on that Slack. We have a channel, and uh, that's a great place to find us. Or just our Git repository is another great place to find us. And, and I'll also add one last thing, which is Adich has done just an amazing job of getting us to where we are. Um, our number two contributor is a 14-year-old uh, who's been pushing actually very very good code commits in. Um, there's absolutely room for anybody who wants to get involved and, you know, do some really cool stuff in the space that I think has a lot of legs to come in and participate in our community. We're very, very welcoming. Any other final thoughts? Nope, that's about it for me.